morning everybody. Today I would like to talk about the geochemical characterization of jade in the greater Caribbean and the source discrimination applying multi-class regression analysis. Um, the geochemical characterization and um, to provide a database of the Caribbean jade is a precondition when one wants to actually provenance um, jade artifacts. As we already heard from Sebastian, there's a problem if we just do it um, petrographically. I would say the best way is to do it destructively using petrography and geochemistry because this gives us most information. But unfortunately, we are not always able to um, get a piece of an object. So we have to find ways to do it um, macroscopically, non-destructively or non-invasively. This is something I will talk about later in my second talk. But now I give you basically the basis uh, for artifact uh, provenance analysis. So we all know that uh, there has been extensive um, exchange between um, and trade between uh, different islands, but also with the mainland. And this is evidenced by uh, finds of exotic materials on certain islands. And one example is jade. And we already heard through all the talks that jade was really valued by the Amerindian uh, due to its physical properties. It's really hard, persistent, it's really suited for making tools, but it's also really appealing by its um, color and also interesting for Amerindians uh, for producing um, beads and uh, pendants. And by geochemically fingerprinting those artifacts and comparing it to a database of known sources, we are then able to unravel those uh, mobility uh, networks. So um, this is a global distribution map of known Jedi sources. And we already heard before that um, Jedi Jade is uh, much rare in occurrence than actually Nephrite. I also would like to make a comment about the terminology jade. So Lasso already told us that it refers to two minerals. I would like to add a third one and talk about omphacite jade. So basically jedi and omphacite are both pyroxenes, um, jedi sodium and omphacite also contains some um, uh, calcium or uh, iron. And if I talk about jade, I'm mainly referring to uh, jadeotite or omphacitite as end members. And then we also have uh, basically um, rocks which have both minerals in them. Um, so these occurrences are always bound to uh, metamorphic uh, complexes. There they generate uh, in subduction zones, where one plate is subducting beneath another one. Then we have the release of fluids um uh either through the breakdown of hydrous minerals or through pore, marine pore waters um, these fluids can precipitate in a rock in veins then it's vein precipitated jade but we also have metasomatic reaction meaning we have a parent rock the fluid is um, introducing the rock and is basically a precipitating change and changing the mineralogy and then in the caribbean we have uh, three sources namely uh, in Guatemala, then in uh, Eastern Cuba and in the Northern Dominican uh, Republic. Guatemala, due to the Motagua Fault Zone, can be actually subdivided in uh, two um, sources, one north of the Motagua Fault Zone and one south of the Motagua Fault Zone. And as we already see on that graph is basically that all these um, sources are aligned uh, along uh, this major fault zone which is an inactive uh, subduction zone that was active for roughly 65 uh, million years. And that is why it's not only mineralogically, but also chemically really challenging in discriminating between these three Jedi sources as they basically uh, feature the same, um, more or less the same formation ages, the same tectonic settings, similar fluids, similar profilates. Um, and this is a challenge which we have to deal with. So we analyzed over 100 jade rocks, jadeite and omphacite containing rocks. Um, we did um, 
strontium isotope uh, composition analysis and neodymium isotope composition analysis by using the TIMS, the thermal ionization mass spectrometer. And we also analyzed the rocks uh, for their lead isotope composition by using the multi-collector ICPMS. So what you see here is the 87, 86 strontium variability um, of uh, the jade sources from the Dominican Republic. Cuba, Guatemala as one source, and then split into north and south of the Motagua fault zone. The crosses are the average of uh, the data, and uh, these lines are indicating um, the mode. So basically, where lies the majority of the data. And uh, what is obvious, um, these are no outliers, so everything is basically the range. These dots are just 0.7% of the data. But all is actually the geochemical range, the variability um, of uh, the strontium isotopic composition. So first of all, what we see is that all sources are uh, heavily overlapping. But what is also notably is that Cuba has actually a quite a small range. And uh, this might be the reason due to the fact that probably uh, Cuban jellets have a really short history of formation. This is also consistent with the formation of, um, with the age of formation of Jedi, but also with the um, age of peak um, metamorphism, which are really close um, to each other, just one to 10 million years uh, away from each other. So therefore, we have a really short and also probably just one single event. Whereas for the other sources, which have a really high variability, we might have multiple stages of uh, jade uh, formation, but we also have late stage hydrothermal alteration, which we clearly do not see in the Cuban samples. When we look at the neodymium isotopic composition uh, variability, it's even worse. Samples are even more overlapping. So neodymium clearly is not uh, something that we can use for um, age discrimination, uh, for source discrimination. This is a plot combining the strontium isotope composition and the neodymium isotope composition. And again, you can see that everything is heavily overlapping. The Cuban samples are clustering quite closely, which is nice, but still it's overlapping heavily, um, especially with the Dominican Republic. Um, and what we see is this late stage alteration, which mainly affected Jedites from the Southern Motaga Falls, but also from the Dominican Republic. If we look at the lead isotopic composition, we see that there's a high variability in the data by itself. There are different reasons for this. We might have uh, fluids generating uh, from um, different types of rocks, but we also have different parent rocks that might have served um, as a profilet. Um, but we also see again for the South Montaga Falls Zone and for the Dominican Republic that we have some rocks that have really high time integrated um, uranium thorium lead uh, ratios um, pointing to really old rocks that have been served for um, these jadeites to precipitate or to, uh, to form those fluids. We also analyzed um, trace elements by ICPMS. And this is just an example of how uh, a normalized trace element pattern uh, might look. I just picked one uh, for Cuba, uh, and I picked uh, one for Guatemala, subdividing into uh, jades from North and South Montagua fault zone. And just by the zigzag pattern, we already see that there's a mobility going on of these um, elements. And uh, this mobility of the different local regions is something that we can actually use to discriminate uh, those sources from each other. So we have, for example, high field strength elements like niobium, tantalum, zirconium, hafnium, which are uh, regionally different. And then we are, uh, but these are actually um, really hard, uh, normally not uh, really mobile, but if you have the right ligands in the fluids, then they are mobile as well. Um, then we have large uh, differences in the large iron uh, lithophile uh, elements like cesium, rubidium, and barium. And these are the differences that we are using um, to discriminate between the sources. Nevertheless, um, 
what we are not using are just pure element abundances because you see there's also a high variability but what we are using are actually trace element ratios these are more significant when it comes to um, discriminating the sources from each other but even if we use uh, bivariate plots and we plot two um, trace element ratios against each other we will always have overlapping sources so we cannot fully discriminate the sources from each other and that's why we thought we will use a statistical approach to uh, better or fully discriminate the sources from each other. So we tried uh, several things with um, our colleagues uh, from ETH uh, Zurich. So we tried principal com component analysis. We basically use those um, analytic, uh, these statistical methods to reduce the amount of trace elements that we have just to find out which are the most discriminatory trace elements we can use. And one approach is uh, principal component analysis, but even here you see that everything is heavily overlapping. So this is not the correct method for our issue. Then uh, we tried something quite new. Uh, the second approach is called um, TSNE. Uh, basically, as you can see, also everything is heavily overlapping. Here we have a lot of possibilities in tuning this model and we tried different options, but there was not one tuning setting that gave us a good split. Then our colleagues came up with the uh, decision tree uh, algorithm and the decision tree is basically um, a flowchart um, structure. So uh, we have 100% uh, of the data set um, in, in a top node. Um, here you see the samples uh, from Cuba, Dominican Republic, and from uh, Guatemala. Uh, we had less samples uh, and analysis when we started this um, method. So as I said, now we have more than 100 samples in our analysis. Um, and then basically on each node we have a test. So in our test is, does one rock have a value which is greater or smaller than a certain uh, value for a trace element ratio, yes or no, and then it falls either to the left or to the right. And we can do that until we have pure classes at the end, but then this is what we would call an overfitted model. So then the model fits very well to our source rock data, but if we have, for example, an artifact which we would like to fit in, um, it might not be assigned correctly. So then another thing that we can do is we can basically pr prune the tree. We can cut it at a certain point to keep it short. And then we guarantee that the tree is quite robust. We might not even, uh, we might not end up with pure classes, but after all, we could give it a kind of probability saying, yes, an artifact has 20% probability coming from Cuba and 80% probability coming from the Dominican Republic. There's just one issue with this approach, and that is basically we do not take into account the analytical error. So for those big samples, um, which are basically 80 milligrams of rock powder, because this is destructive, we, uh, the analytical error is more or less neglectable. But on my second talk, I will show you that we are working with really tiny amounts of artifact um, material. Uh, microgram amounts of artifact material and then the analytical error is getting bigger so then this value yes or no is not valid, valid anymore because it will be in a certain range so that's why we decided to use uh, the, another approach which is called the multi-class uh, regression approach and what we do there is basically we are not having one trace element ratio at a split, but we are using multiple trace element ratios at a split at the same time, and therefore the ana analytical error um, is neglectable. But what we need to do for the multi-class regression analysis compared to the decision tree, this is really elegant because we do not need to uh, normalize the data. You saw there's a huge variability in uh, the data and in the values of the data but we have to normalize the data basically for the multi-class regression uh, analysis. And what we did is we uh, normalized each trace element ratio for each source in that way that the mean is set to zero and the standard deviation is set to one. 
And uh, then we already saw that there are certain trace element ratios which are really suited in discriminating one source from the other. We also performed a so-called T-test or Welsh test, which shows us the significance of trace element ratios that are suited for discriminating sources from each other. So, for example, if we look at the ratio zirconium hafnium, here you see these are South Mutago Fault Zone, North Mutago Fault Zone, Dominican Republic, Cuba. And here again, Cuba, Dominican Republic, North Mutago Fault Zone, South Mutago Fault Zone. So basically, if we want to separate Cuba and the Dominican Republic from Guatemala, we can use zirconium hafnium as this is a very significant ratio. If we, for example, would like to discriminate Cuba from the um, South Montago Falls on, we could use the ratio Submarium Euterbium, which is a very um, significant ratio. So we performed this test to filter which ratios to use at a, a certain split. And then we came up with um, a three-class model where we are able to separate Cuba versus the Dominican Republic versus Guatemala as one source. So first we have a group Cuba, Dominican Republic versus Guatemala, and we are splitting the source rocks by using zirconium hafnium, lantern thorium, and um, yttrium thorium, which gives us more than 98% correct classification of the source rocks. And then after all, we are splitting Cuba from the Dominican Republic using those trace element ratios. And here we are still getting 83% uh, of correct uh, classification. Splitting Dominican Republic from Cuba is quite challenging as those sources are pretty close. So therefore they have more um, geochemical uh, similarities. But we were really uh, optimistic and tried also to do a four class model. So then also splitting um, Guatemala as two sources. And uh, we are using um, six ratios for doing that. And at least we achieved more than 89% of correct classification. But I would say if it comes to provenance work, just the first split already saying whether something comes from Cuba and the Dominican Republic or from Guatemala, I think this is already a big step in, uh, in, in the Caribbean archaeology, just to be able to um, discrimination, discriminating between those two main areas. So uh, to conclude, uh, I have showed you that Caribbean shade sources are heavily geochemically overlapping. Um, outcrop and hand specimen heterogeneity are significant. So that's why we are using trace element ratios, which are better suited for discriminating just than trace element concentrations. Um, due to the relative young age of most prophylates and the time of jade formation, isotope compositions are not really distinct between source regions. Nevertheless, Cuban samples have uh, least radiogenic 87-86 uh, strontium ratios, and this might help, might be helpful in uh, characterizing artifacts in the future. Um, also, given the complex tectonics of the region, we cannot rule out that there are more sources that are still not known. Uh, so, therefore, the model has to be adapted uh, if known other sources um, are uh, found. Um, by using multiple trace element ratios at a specific split, we are decreasing the analytical um, the significance of the analytical error which is uh, important for future predictive models for uh, artifact data assignment. And I have shown you that we are basically able to uh, separate uh, the three main sources from each other, but we are also able to do a kind of four-class model. Thanks for your attention.